We're going to begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. Scripture says this, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Here's Paul going on a little rabbit trail. We're going to read this one. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Uh, I I did also baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone or else. But Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel and not with eloquent wisdom so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. Turn over to chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will, have, each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field. Now he's going to mix metaphors. God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. In this passage, Paul is trying to help the church to understand some critical concepts that should have shaped their life together. But for one reason or another, they weren't getting what Paul was selling. And so he has to go back to the beginning and redefine again for them some of the most basic concepts of the gospel. And he's going to define for them what it means for the church to be a community. He's going to, under, he's going to define what it means to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's going to define what divisions mean for the church and their consequences. These should be basic teachings. But for one reason or another, the Corinthians have failed to understand them. And so we're going to follow Paul as he discusses first, and we're going to start at the end of the passage for this, the significance of the language temple of the Holy Spirit. That is going to be essential that we understand that. That's going to be the hardest part. Secondly, we're going to talk about the dangers of divisions in Christian community and the real peril they have for us and why they're such a problem for Paul. And then third, we're going to talk about the way in which different faith traditions can be discerned as to whether or not they are godly or not. We're going to start, though, with what I consider to be the essential principle that Paul is drawing off of, and it's the significance of the temple. So look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. I'm going to read this again. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Now, I I don't know about you, but when I was young, I discerned this. I'm not saying anybody should be blamed for teaching it to me, but I discerned that one of the reasons I shouldn't smoke is that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and I shouldn't bring harm to it. I don't know why eating chocolate didn't bother me, but smoking did. That's wrong. That's wrong. It may not be wrong in eternity. I don't know. You can talk to God, but it's not what Paul is saying. 
Here's where we need to expand our vocabulary. Now, Greek can do, Greek is the language that the Bible's written in. And it's translated into English. And there are things that Greek can do that English can't do. Now, don't be offended by that. There are things English can do that Greek can't do. But there are some things that Greek can do that English can't do. And one of those things is if I say to you, you, go to the foyer. Am I talking to all of you or one of you? You have no idea. Our you doesn't tell you whether I'm talking to a group or a single individual. It doesn't tell us whether it's plural or not. The English word you is just you. Only contest can tell you if I'm talking to one person, two people, five people, 20 people, or 150 people. Greek is not that way. Greek has a singular and a plural form. And all of the yous in that verse, those verses I just read are plural. But the word temple is singular. In the South, they have a word for a plural you. You know what it is, right? Y'all. And so I'm going to read this with the, the plural yous appropriately placed. So this is what the text says. Do y'all not know that you're all our God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in y'all. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and y'all are that temple. Now what is not here is the idea that you individually are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The yous are plural. But it also doesn't say y'all are temples. The word temple is not plural. So what we do not have here in Paul is the idea that each individual Christian is an isolated individual temple walking around filled with the Holy Spirit. That is not what Paul is saying. Matter of fact, if he were saying that, his entire argument in this passage would be lunacy. It would make no sense at all. What Paul is saying is that you all together are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You all together are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If the ancient temple in Israel was made of stones, the temple of the Holy Spirit today is made of people. That is essentially important for us. Once you start to grasp Paul's idea, everything else he says begins to make sense. Matter of fact, everything else Jesus says begins to make sense. In the Old Testament, God had promised to make his presence specially manifest in the tabernacle, in the temple, and especially manifest in one part of the temple, in what was called the most holy place, or the holy of holies. Now, you can find throughout the Psalms the idea that God is everywhere. David says, where can I flee from your presence? Jonah tried to run away from God and found that even going to Tarshish was not going to be successful to get away from him. So the Hebrew people knew that God was everywhere. So God has decided to dwell in one part of his creation in the heavens. So the, in the Israelite people knew this, but they also knew that God would specially promise to make himself apparent and manifest to human senses in a particular location within the heavens. And that was in the temple. Jesus takes that lesson, and you remember it, some of you, in Matthew, and he says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, There I am in their midst. New temple. Temple now is a people for Jesus. And Paul is catching on to that. And he's trying to help the Corinthians understand that together they form the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God is specially manifest. Even though God fills the heavens and there's no way we can escape from his presence, he has promised to be specially concentrated, to specially place his attention where the people of God are gathered. And that's what it means to have a temple. And we are that temple. Do y'all not know that y'all are God's temple? That God's spirit dwells in y'all. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is holy. And y'all are that temple. Because the community of faith is the temple of the Holy Spirit, we must recognize that the sanctity and ceremony that was designated for the temple and the tabernacle in the First Testament is now reserved for the gathered community of faith. That's why we baptize together. That's why we read the word together. That's why we pray for each other together. Because this, not this building, but the gathered community of faith is the temple of the Holy Spirit.
And that means whatever we might feel, if we go off by ourselves into the woods or we go out to fish or climb a mountain and we feel something. It may be God, there's no way to escape from his presence, but he has not promised to meet us there. He has promised to meet us here. So what's the danger of division? Well, you can probably already imagine it. Go back to chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 13. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's going on in Corinth is that they have a pedigree problem. They think that pedigree is important. And so they're trying to evaluate who is the most Christian Christian. And so some of them came to faith in Jesus with Jesus himself. How much better of a Christian could you be? I came to Jesus. Others didn't ever meet Jesus. They came through the teaching of Peter. So they say, well, I came through Cephas. That's Peter's name in Aramaic. Others say, well, I came to Jesus through Paul. And others said, well, I came through Apollos. And now we're trying to decide which of us is best. Which of us is better. Where's the better pedigree? Who's the most Christian Christian? Who does God approve of the most? And Paul says, you guys are like toddlers screaming at each other. Paul is attempting to reorient their thinking. Paul wants them to understand that what God wants is not a hierarchy of better and worse Christians, but a unified body who worships him. God doesn't think, and Paul's going to get into this later on, right? That we should be deciding who's more productive in the body, the mouth, the eye, the hand, the toe. But we should be together as a body worshiping God and being his hands and feet in the world. You might remember that Jesus said in the gospel when he was talking about demons, can a kingdom divided against itself stand? And he says, no. Well, Paul's taking that same teaching here in the church. If we continue to bite and devour each other, not that you and I are, I hope not. But if the church does that, then it's like the stones of the ancient temple refusing to work together. I can't help thinking about denominations when I think about this. Do you, did that happen to you when you read it? I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and I think I'm a Wesleyan, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Baptist. Does it feel that way to you? It does to me. And I wonder what Paul would say to us. And I don't think he's going to say that theological differences are not important because there are going to be plenty of places in 1 Corinthians where Paul warns them about false teachers. And so I don't think it's that. I don't think he's saying we don't hold each other accountable and we just let li live and let live because in chapter 5, Paul is going to tell the church that they have failed to discipline somebody who deeply needed to be disciplined. So it can't be that no divisiveness is ever allowed or nothing that could ever be divisive. But somehow for Paul, the very idea that our first loyalty is to something other than the unity of the church is problematic. If you and I do not come to Christian community with the idea that peace is what we should be seeking, then we desecrate the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to hurt each other. There's no way we're not going to, which is why forgiveness has to be an ethic of the kingdom. Because if God's people won't forgive each other when they harm each other, then there is no way the temple can stand. So forgiveness has to be part of what we do. Now, we don't strive to hurt each other, I hope. But we know it's going to happen. But we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our division, our attitude of divisiveness will bring desecration to the temple of God's Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul means to say when he says, the one who destroys this temple, God will destroy him. He's not talking about the one who overeats and hurts his body. He's talking about the one who divides the church. How do we know then if a faith tradition is true? Because certainly we have to use our discernment. Certainly we're going to disagree about points of theology. Certainly some people are going to interpret the Bible one way and other people another. And we're not going to necessarily come to agreement. So if we're not allowed to be divided, then how, how is there room for this kind of disagreement that has to happen for us to discover truth? I think that's a great question. And I think Paul's Responses, time will tell. Time will tell. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. I'm just going to start reading in verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. 
For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. So this question of whether or not there can be disagreements or different traditions, I think Paul anticipates that there will be. So he tells us, first of all, if a tradition is building on a foundation other than, and he says Jesus Christ is his shorthand here, in the book of Ephesians, he'll break that down further and say the foundation is the prophets and the apostles with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. So as long as we are building on that foundation... We don't know who's speaking the truth or not until time reveals the truth and quality of the work. So again, we must be on this foundation. But you and I both know there are many faith traditions that we are all convinced are building on that same foundation, but have built very differently. What Paul insists is that you can go with somebody who's building on the right foundation, and time will tell whether or not the quality of that work will last, because God will make sure that poor theological work is burnt up. God will make sure that poor theological work is burnt up. So Paul uses two metaphors. The first is the sowing of seeds. This goes back to Jesus' teaching of the farmer sowing his seeds, right? And some seed seed falls on the path and it gets whips up right away. Other seed falls among rocky soil. It sprouts up quickly, but it has no root and eventually it withers. Other seed goes into thorny soil. It grows up, but the thorns choke it out and other falls on good soil and it produces a harvest. This is what Paul seems to be borrowing from with the planting and watering thing. There are certainly some false teachings that fall on the path and they can't even be considered by Christians. They're just whisked away, right? There are others that seem to grow quickly and we think, wow, God must be working in that place. But then they wither. There are others that grow up, but then the difficulties and church divisiveness and arguments and all that stuff happens and it chokes out the ministry and it falls. And the quality of the work is known. So what we have here for Paul in those verses I just read is the idea that it is, not, it is not dangerous to your salvation to find out later that you followed a wrong builder. If the builder was trying to build on the foundation of Jesus, that builder will be saved, but through fire. So what Paul wants to establish is that it doesn't matter who built on the foundation of Jesus for you as much as it matters what foundation is being built on. And so he insists, no other foundation can be laid but the one I laid, because Paul's an apostle, and that foundation is Jesus. But others will build on it, and time will tell whether or not they are true to the gospel or false. So should there be disagreements? Yes, there should. Should there be discernment? Yes, there should. May there be different faith traditions? Yes, there may. But we are all beholden to the same foundation. And we all have to be willing to see with open eyes the wood, hay, and stubble that God is trying to purge away. That's what Paul, I think, is insisting. Because the the Corinthians, he knows the foundation was strong because he laid it. But others have built on it, and this church has a lot of wood, hay, and stubble. And he's going to get ready to tell them what it is. And Paul's going to be the fire by which God begins to purify it. He's even going to claim that some of the difficulties they're having as a community is because they were building poorly in some areas, and he's going to try and correct it. Many will build upon the foundation. We'll know who is building well because the Holy Spirit will reveal the quality of each person's work. God has insisted that as we build a faith tradition, as we make disciples in the church of Jesus, that the quality of the tradition of which we are part will be told in the quality of the building it produces. It seems to me the church in America has not built well Because we are falling apart. But that shouldn't discourage us. That should remind us that God is at work. And we need to collect the precious stones from every one of these traditions and build better. 
Because God has promised that workmanship faithful to his kingdom will last, we must trust the spirit of God in time to reveal what is true and what is false. So here are some takeaways. I'm going to just give you a couple takeaways as we close. First, our attitude when we come together has to be to recognize that God is specially present where his people gather. And we need to stop arguing that God is more present where nobody is. So we must recognize that gathering together as a body of believers, wherever we do it, whether it's in a home or in a sanctuary or out in a field, if we gather together, God is there, whether you feel him or not. So let's not forsake gathering together, as some are in the habit of doing. That's Hebrews 10, 24. The second thing is, That if we are to gather as a body of believers, understanding that we together are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You might say, but I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And I would say, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. So you are filled with the Holy Spirit the same way my finger is filled with me. But if I cut off my finger, the question of how full of me it is anymore is a deep question, right? So we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. And yes, you too, if you are part of the body. So begin to realize that my very holiness is tied to the community in which I've chosen to participate. If we don't come here with the attitude that we must seek peace, that God is most glorified when his people forgive each other, That he's most glorified when his people are gracious with each other. When they understand each other's frailties and weaknesses. If we don't understand that, we fail to know what it means to be a holy people. That's not to say we don't judge each other. We're going to get to that in 1 Corinthians 5. But it does mean that our goal in everything is peace and unity in the body of Christ. And finally... Yes, we'll disagree with each other. A matter of fact, it's important that we have all this forgiveness in place because God expects we will disagree with each other. And we will have different faith traditions. And we will choose to participate in different faith traditions. But we must understand that none of those things define us. Those are just part of our searching to find the truth about God that we are so desperately seeking. What unifies us? is the foundation of the prophets and apostles with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. That testimony is preserved in the scriptures. And so there is no building without scripture. So when I hear somebody say, yeah, I know Paul thought that, but Paul's probably wrong. When I hear that, I think different foundation, different faith.